Well, good morning and uh, welcome to another teaching. It is a Wednesday morning here in Texas and it's a uh, man, it's a good morning to be spending time with Jesus, loving on Jesus, growing to know him, growing to love him, growing to obey him, growing to know his love for us and above all, growing to please him in every manner and in every way more and more and more and more. It's the meaning of life, right? Just growing to, to be like Jesus more and more and more. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, so uh, this is the, the, the second teaching and what I think is the second section of, of uh, understanding suffering. And, you know, what we're dealing with in this section is that it is indeed the Lord. It is our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit that oftentimes directly cause suffering in our lives and in the lives of humanity. It's important to understand because, um, again, there's a belief out there that, that God only allows suffering. Now, he certainly allows it, okay? Oftentimes, suffering is certainly a result or consequence of our own sin and disobedience. Suffering in general, as we said, um, is a result of sin in the world. However, um, oftentimes, as we're certainly going to see here in the, in the plagues that, that came on Egypt, um, the suffering came directly from the Lord, directly from our Heavenly Father. He is causing the suffering to come on Egypt, horrible suffering, and he's doing it because of their rebellion. He's doing it because of their noncompliance. He's doing it because of their disobedience. And, and there are times, yes, even as Christians, where our Heavenly Father will cause us to suffer in one way or another. He'll cause us to, to have pain and suffering because of our rebellion, because of our disobedience, because of our obstinance, because of our indifference. And so it's just been, not, man, it's been fascinating in studying this. I've never, uh, not that I can recall, taught through these plagues, but they're they're remarkable. There's so much to be learned. So again, I don't know how many teachings this is going to be, but uh, you know, the more I study for this, the more I prepare. Again, we're dealing with the topic of, of understanding suffering, um, but there's so much in here to glean. So hopefully we're going to we're going to do some good exposition, you know, while we point out the very clear, the very clear, undeniable fact that it is God himself, that it's our, our heavenly father, Jesus Christ, our Lord and the Holy Spirit, who is clearly causing the suffering. Um, so, again, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy, your favor, your goodness, your grace on our lives. Father, we thank you for your love, your wonder. Um, Father, we thank you that we have our Bible. We thank you that we can go to the word of God, the scriptures, to understand everything, Lord. We thank you that we have this Bible as a manual for life. Father, we don't like it. I, I certainly don't enjoy at all suffering or pain or, or hardship or difficulty. Father, I do thank you that you are always using it for our good as you've, as you've promised us. We just worship you and we thank you, Father. Above all, we thank you for Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and King. Lord Jesus, as always, we thank you for becoming a human man for us. We thank you for living a perfect, righteous life on our behalf that we certainly could never live. We thank you for dying a torturous death on our behalf that we deserve to die. And we thank you that you're alive and risen and we worship you today, our risen Savior. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open your word. We ask you to give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, so we're in Exodus 9 still, and we're going to pick up in verse 8. The first plague was the plague of livestock. Uh, just remarkable principles in there. We talked about it last time. And now this is the plague of boils, okay? Just festering boils all over all the Egyptians, oozing pus, festering boils. I, I used to have boils, a, a boil I would get sometimes when I was a young boy, you know, I don't know, seven or eight or nine years old, man, and they would hurt and they would be terrible. I can't imagine having them 
all over your body. Have you ever had a boil? All right, the plague of boils, Exodus 9, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from a furnace and have Moses toss it into the air in the presence of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over the whole land of Egypt and festering boils will break out on men and animals throughout the land. So they took soot from a furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Moses tossed it into the air and festering boils broke out on men and animals. Verse 11, the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and on all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord had said to Moses. So again, um, this is, you know, uh, God had commanded Pharaoh through Moses to, to release the people of Egypt out of, out of slavery, out of the bondage of slavery. And again, Pharaoh just refused to listen. Okay. Um, so again, we see it here. So they took soot from a furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Moses tossed it into the air and festering boils broke out on men and animals. Okay. Interesting. The magicians who were standing before Moses earlier in Exodus and mimicking most of, of the miracles that he did by their demonic arts, by evil spirits, right? They can't even stand before Moses now. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and on all the all the Egyptians. And again, when 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 I was a young boy and I had a boil, again, it was terrible. It would hurt. It would there'd be pus that would come out of it. It was festering, as this said. But I mean, I could walk around and stand here. The boils are so bad. The suffering inflicted by God himself. OK, uh, on the Egyptians is, is so bad that that it's hard for them just to just to get around. Mm, golly. All right. Let's look at the plague of hail. Uh, we're in Exodus nine. We're going to start in 13. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. So again, you see now, you see now the Lord giving a direct command to Moses and a direct command to Pharaoh. As we're going to see in here, everything belongs to the Lord, right? Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and, and all who live in it. So this entire, not only the, the earth, the universe, everything belongs to Jesus, okay? Um, Colossians 1, 15 to 17 makes it clear that Jesus is the author and creator of anything, right? The Gospel of John says that nothing was made that has been made without Jesus. Remember, Jesus is full-blown almighty God. Our sin is so bad and so wicked in a way that we really don't comprehend that our God himself, God the Son, in the person of Jesus Christ, took on humanity, had to himself enter into this world, add humanity to his deity, become the God-man, live the perfect righteous life on our behalf that we could never live, die a torturous death on our behalf that we should have died and deserved to die, and then was raised from the dead. When we put our full faith and trust and confidence in Jesus alone, when we, when you, when we genuinely receive Jesus as our only Lord and Savior, Okay, that perfect righteous life that Jesus actually lived when he walked the earth is credited to us as if we lived it. Incredible as that sounds, that's what the scripture teaches. That righteous life that Jesus lived is credited to us as if we lived it. We didn't live it, but our heavenly father counts it to us as if we did. And all of our sin, past, present, and future is actually taken from us and credited to Jesus on the cross. It's overwhelming, right? Uh, C.S. Lewis commented that this is never, ever something 
that the mind of man would have conceived. Uh, he had read tens of thousands of books, right? M maybe the greatest reader ever, C.S. Lewis, right? Certainly, many say the, the most prolific author of his generation, of anyone he ever lived with, of, of the entire 20th century, right? Um, and having read so much intuitively, in all other religions, he could see the hand or the mind of, of man or woman um, that, that had conceived of this in every other religion. But one of the big things that brought him to biblical Christianity and that, that this can be the only way is that in, in reading the scriptures and understanding true biblical Christianity, he said that this is not something that the mind of man would have ever conceived. Hence must be divine. Has God, hence God is real and Jesus is the only way. That incredible exchange, right? All of my sin, my disgusting sin and yours, past, present, and future is credited to Jesus at the cross when you receive him and genuinely trust him as your Lord and Savior. And that perfect righteous life that he lived is credited to you and credited to me. Again, that exchange uh, the perfect righteous life of Jesus for all of my sin is the heart of the Christian gospel. And that exchange is what happens when someone becomes a genuine Christian, when they humble themselves before the Lord, fully acknowledge their hopeless, helpless, desperate, hellbound state. Okay. Uh, a Christian is someone who understands that without Jesus, only hell awaits. And they're literally now clinging to Jesus alone believing in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, relying on Jesus alone for the forgiveness of their sins, the salvation of their soul, deliverance from eternal hell, and to bring them to heaven when they die. Jesus Christ is actually living in them. Wow. Okay. So, all right. Let's look at this uh, plague of hail. Okay. Exodus 9, again, verse 13, the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Verse 14, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. So again, this, this series is talking about understanding suffering. And in this section, we're dealing with the fact that that God himself, each member of the triune God, okay, remember, God is one being, three distinct individual separate persons, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, they're all God, they're all omniscient, omnipresent, and, and omnipotent, meaning they know everything, which means they can't learn anything, uh, they can do anything, um, and they're everywhere at all times. The, they live outside of time, again, uh, the mystery of the Trinity is difficult to understand. You know, one what? God is what he is. Who he is, is God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And each member of the Trinity, we see indeed, will will, will directly cause suffering. And that's, that's an important aspect. It's a pivotal aspect of understanding that certainly either our Heavenly Father allows it or he himself causes it. Here he is absolutely causing suffering the suffering, terrible suffering to come on Egypt because of their rebellion and disobedience. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Verse 14, or this time. Okay, so you see, Pharaoh has an opportunity. He doesn't have to suffer. He can obey. And it's the same with us. Again, Hebrews 12 says our, that our heavenly father disciplines us as his, as his genuine children you know, so that so that we'll be more compliant and obedient children that are pleasing to him. We don't have to be disciplined by our Heavenly Father. We don't have to undergo suffering that as a result of our rebellion. Now, there's also suffering that comes uh, as a result of, of living for Christ. Sometimes we can suffer for Christ. Um, there's suffering that comes as a result of a, of, of a spiritual attack. We have spiritual enemies. Um, and we'll get into that 
later in the series. Or this time, I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people. Why? So you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. Verse 15. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. So do you see that? Egypt doesn't understand. Egypt has their own gods. Uh, they thought Pharaoh was a living God. All ridiculous. Okay. Moses is now speaking on behalf of our heavenly father of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And says in verse 15, this is the Lord speaking through Moses, for by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. Okay. Jesus could in any moment wipe, wipe out all of humanity, right? Verse 16, but I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Again, it is our job to bring glory to our Heavenly Father and to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You still set yourself against my people and will not let them go. Verse 18, therefore, at this time tomorrow. So again, here's the deal. Pharaoh could have heard this and said, listen, I saw what happened with the livestock. I saw what happened with the boils and, and I'm sorry. Okay, boom. You have my blessing, you can go. But he doesn't do it. Now, you'll see here, he's going to begin to change his mind, right? All right, let me see. All right. All right, verse 16. I'm sorry, verse 18. Therefore, at this time tomorrow, I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever fallen on Egypt from the day it was founded till now. And again, I will send. Verse 19, give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter because the hail will fall on every man and animal that has not been brought in and is still out in the field and they will die. So again, we don't know how big this is. This could be that kind of, you know, softball size hail. This is, this is obviously uh, overwhelmingly powerful hail. I mean, in Texas, sometimes we get some strong hailstorms. This is this is infinitely greater than that. Anyone outside is going to be killed, any animal or any person. Okay, and they will die. Verse twenty. Look at this. Those officials look at this. Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. Verse 21, but those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. So again, after the first two plagues, you'd think people would have got it. They would have understood. You think the Egyptians would have been like, okay, you win, Lord. But still, people just, the Lord could do countless miracles in our lives. He could do remarkable things among us. And yet, there are many, most in the world, that still refuse to believe. No matter what the Lord does, they won't bow to knee to Jesus. And, and, and here's the deal, that, that if you won't do it in this life, you absolutely will do it in the next life. Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, of this life and the next life. And in Philippians 2, it says that every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But if you don't do it in this life, if you don't receive Jesus as your only Lord and Savior, there will be no opportunity in the next life and only an eternity in hell awaits. I understand that sounds intolerant, but it's, it's the greatest love that we can show as Christians is to urge everyone, all 8.3 billion people in the world, to receive Jesus. Hmm. Verse 22, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that hail will fall all over Egypt on men and animals and on everything growing in the fields of Egypt. When Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, verse 23, the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed down to the ground. So the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. It couldn't be more plain who's causing the suffering, right? 
Verse 24, hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Verse 25, throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both men and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. The only place it did not hail was the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. So again, you see the omnipotence. Omnipotence means that our God, our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit, again, we have a triune God, all-powerful, can do anything. Hail destroys everything that's not inside, just destroys everything. Plants, animals, trees, people, everything is killed, except in the land of Goshen, the only place, verse 26, it did not hail, was the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. So again, it's we see the overwhelming, omnipotent power of our God here, right? Wow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. Whew. Okay. Checking the time here. All right. All right. Verse 27. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned, he said to them. The Lord is in the right. And my people and I and my people are in the wrong. Verse 28, pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. And this is a, you know, this is a very powerful scripture. So Pharaoh is beginning to get it. He's beginning, you know, he's starting to have a little bit of faith. And again, this is such a picture of the hardness of hearts of people today, that that there's a refusal to, number one, by many to believe that there is a God at all, but then to understand that, that, that there is only one way, Jesus himself, right? John 14, 6 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. These are Jesus' own words, Okay, um, and, and, it, and it often seems that that no matter what happens, people refuse to bend the knee to Jesus. And sometimes they'll they'll begin, they'll begin to listen, but then again, they're just they're just led away again to the futility of their own beliefs. It's sad. Pharaoh here is going to begin this process of repentance. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned. He confesses his sin here in disobeying the Lord. He said to them, the Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Every one of us ought to confess that. All 8.3 billion people in the world must confess that. If you if you desire to have your sins forgiven, to a, avoid an eternity in hell and to go to heaven when you die, you have to get to this place where you say, the Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Every human being is a fallen, sinful unworthy, hell-bound sinner, and only the mercy we have in Jesus Christ our Lord can deliver us from that and deliver us to heaven and bring us to be children of our heavenly Father. He, he's, he's convinced enough to ask Moses to pray. Verse 28, pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hail I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. And, and sometimes, and, and Moses is going to pray, okay? Sometimes there will be people, there'll be non-Christians. They may even be in other religions. They may be Hindus. They may be Muslims. They may be Buddhists. They may be free thinkers. They may be, uh, you know, uh, agnostics. They're not sure there's something out there. But, but sometimes they will ask for prayer, right, in, in desperate situations, and we should do it, Right. As, uh, you know, as Christians, obviously our greatest prayer is that people would come to know Jesus, that they don't have to spend an eternity in hell. But we should, we should be willing to pray for anyone that asks for it, right? Pharaoh says in verse 28, pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. 29, Moses replied, when I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. The thunder will stop. And there will be no more hail. So you may know that the earth is the Lord's. Okay. You just heard me quote Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. 
the world and all who live in it. Everything belongs to Jesus. Here Moses says the same thing, right? Verse 29, the thunder will stop and there will be no more hail so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. Verse 30, but I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord God. Again, it's near insanity, right? But Moses can tell that they want the problems to stop. We all do, right? Even as even as a, a what I hope to be a devout Christian believer, I I you know, when I'm going through, you know, trials or difficulties or when all of us are going through sufferings, we we want it to stop. And our fear of the Lord tends to go up. Regrettably only and generally when we're going through hardship, we ought to be increasingly growing to fear the Lord, to walk in an awe and a respect and a reverence and a fear, knowing that he is indeed our heavenly father and he will cause us to suffer. But it seems that 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 for the vast majority of the time, that even as believers, even as genuine Christians, that only happens when we're in difficulty. Right. We want it to stop. And then when it does stop, we tend to oftentimes float right back into into disobedience. Moses says in verse 30, Moses said, but I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord God. Verse 31, the flax and barley were still destroyed since the barley had headed and the flax was in bloom. Verse 32, the wheat and spelt, however, were not destroyed because they ripened later. Verse 33, then Moses left Pharaoh and went out of the city. He spread out his hands toward the Lord. The thunder and hail stopped and the rain no longer poured down on the land. Verse 34, when Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. Do you see that? Once again, the problem goes away. And I'll say this again. Uh, this is for us as believers. When we, if we look back on your life, our, our prayer seems to lessen, our Bible study lessens, our focus lessens. When suffering stops, we, we go back into seemingly enjoying our life and going about our own business and we don't seek the Lord in the same way. So we can see that the Lord often causes suffering for our good. It's, it's almost like we pursue him a lot more. Not almost, we do. Our prayer is, is you know, we're praying with others. We're just more intentional in prayer. Our, our prayer is just overall more focused. We're more thankful. We're more desperate. Verse 34, when Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. Verse 35, so Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. Wow. Um, so again, we you see Pharaoh goes back on his word. How many times have we, uh, you know, how many times have we made foolish declarations to the Lord? You know, if you'll only do this, if you'll only do this, Lord Jesus, then I'll do this. Um, you know, we ought to never do that. You know, Oswald Chambers, there's an incredible devotion out there, devotional, in my opinion, probably the best one. Um, it's called My Upmost for His Highest. My Upmost for His Highest. It's by Oswald Chambers. It's a, it's a one-page daily devotional. There's 365 devotions, and, and, and they're sound. I've done it my whole life, on and off, my whole Christian life. Um, and, and they're powerful, sound, biblical devotions. Um, and, and, and Chambers says in one of them that, uh, you know, let's not make foolish promises, okay? Let's let our yes be yes and no, no. Uh, but again, just uh, when, when things get better, when we get well, when a relative or, you know, someone we love uh, is healed from a sickness or we're delivered from financial difficulty or relational difficulty or our marriage is restored or, you know, just the, the Lord delivers us in some way and the pain and suffering stops. It's just so easy for us to slip back into our own lifestyle, into our old lifestyle. And again, this is this is for us as Christians and you know, and to not pursue the Lord in the same way, to not fear him in the same way, to not love him in the same way, to not, to not be as devoted as we were during the time of sickness. 
So, all right. So next time we're going to get into the, the plague of locusts. And, uh, you know, again, just what we're showing here is that there can be no doubt. And, and we're going to go past. These are just the plagues in Egypt. But we're going to go into other scriptures that show that suffering is often indeed caused by our Heavenly Father as a result of our obstinance or our disobedience or our rebellion or our noncompliance. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy, your favor, your goodness, and your grace on our lives. We thank you for your love. Father, we thank you that we have these, these scriptures. We thank you that we have the the incredible testimony of the word of God where we can read, Lord, you know, where we can read where you did indeed cause tremendous suffering and difficulty and pain and death on the Egyptians. Father, I ask you to open our hearts, help us that we would understand these things that we would not have to go through unnecessary suffering because of our disobedience, because of our selfishness. Mm. Father, we just worship you and thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you just for your love and your mercy and your goodness and your grace in our lives. Holy Spirit, we ask you to seal this message to our hearts now. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that understand, we pray in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen and amen.